On Saturday, February 13, 1886, in New York City, the body of Major General Winfield Scott Hancock traveled to Norristown, Pennsylvania, his native state, and was laid to rest there. Everywhere the general's remains traveled, a crowd formed to view the famed warrior of the American Civil War. Ulysses S. Grant wrote in his memoirs that Hancock stands the most conspicuous figure of all the general officers who did not exercise a separate command. He commanded a corps longer than any other, and his name was never mentioned as having committed in battle a blunder for which he was responsible. His genial disposition made him friends, and his personal courage and his presence with his command in the thickest of the fight won for him the confidence of troops serving under him. No matter how hard the fight, the Second Corps always felt that their commander was looking after them. Hancock's life started simple enough. He and his identical twin brother Hillary were born on February 14, 1824 in the hamlet of Montgomery Square in Pennsylvania. Winfield Scott Hancock was named after the hero of the War of 1812, General Winfield Scott. His ancestry was made up of English, Scottish, and Welsh immigrants to the United States and had settled in Pennsylvania because of the good economic opportunities that the region had to offer. His mother and father, Elizabeth and Benjamin Hancock, moved their little family to Norristown where Benjamin taught school and studied for the bar while his wife, Elizabeth, helped him make and sell ladies' hats in a store. The couple struggled for some years while Benjamin established himself as a lawyer. Winfield's father was a deacon in the local Baptist church and a strong Democrat. Hancock's biographer stated, Winfield, the lawyer's son, had instilled in him from an early age respect and reverence for the law, for the concept of due process, for the Almighty, and for the principles and tenets of the Democratic Party as they matured in the age of Jackson and Van Buren. As expected for identical twins, Winfield and Hillary were inseparable, and indistinguishable in their early years. Their father was on the board of trustees for the Norristown Academy, and so the boys attended school there. But when Pennsylvania implemented its public school system, the boys were enrolled in it. Their father would sit in on the school board for 30 years. Winfield got into an expected amount of trouble as a young man, but did well in his studies. His mother and father made sure that he attended Sunday school every week as well. He became such a well-known young man with an excellent reputation that he was chosen to read the Declaration of Independence for the town's celebration in 1839. Some stories were relayed years later that Winfield had gotten together a group of young men from Norristown and had formed them up into marching columns and battle lines, and it was this military bent that signaled to others that Winfield wanted to pursue a career in the army. His father was hesitant for his son to go that route, but one of Benjamin's colleagues in the law profession wanted to write the Secretary of War to advocate for the young man's appointment to the United States Military Academy. Benjamin relented, and the congressman in his district selected Winfield to attend West Point. At the age of 16, Hancock entered the academy. In the summer of 1840, Winfield Scott Hancock passed his entrance exam and was officially admitted into West Point. As all first-year freshmen did, he spent July and August in an encampment to simulate military life. He was thrilled when President Martin Van Buren, a fellow Democrat, came to visit the young cadets that summer. Another visitor that Winfield was excited to meet was General Winfield Scott himself, his namesake. Scott would visit the summer encampment and gather the young men around him and tell them war stories, which the young men were eager to hear. The old general met with the young man and was pleased with his promise as a future military leader. Although Winfield was not a troublesome student, he found that one could rack up demerits very easily. 200 demerits would get a cadet sent home, but Hancock was careful to never receive more than 140 in a single year. The superintendent of West Point was Major Richard Delafield, called Dicky the Punster behind his back. He won good graces with the cadets Winfield's first year when he introduced a new style of pantaloons with buttons in the front rather than the side. The cadets became acquainted with the superintendent and his two adjutants, Lieutenant Irvin McDowell and Lieutenant Joseph Hooker. Hancock's class of 1844 was not the most illustrious class of cadets. Out of the 54 who started out, only 25 graduated, and of those 25, only 5 served in the Union Army and 3 served in the Confederate Army. Of those who served in either army, only a few were notable. Alfred Pleasanton led Federal Cavalry for the Army of the Potomac. Alexander Hayes commanded a brigade and a division under Hancock, and Simon Bolivar Buckner worked his way up the Confederate ranks to become a very prominent general. Although his class was not as famous as others, he was surrounded by future leaders in classes behind and in front of him, including Ulysses S. Grant, James Longstreet, 
George McClellan, Thomas Jonathan Jackson, Fitz John Porter, and Edmund Kirby Smith. Hancock graduated 18th out of 25. His grades were not spectacular, and in fact, were very mediocre. The class of 1844 were then sent off to different commands. However, Hancock's low score landed him in the infantry, the 6th Infantry Regiment to be more specific. Hancock was stationed with the 6th Infantry in the Indian Territory, first at Fort Tosin on the Red River, then to Fort Washita on the Washita River. During this time, in what was called the Permanent Indian Frontier, relations between whites and Native Americans were comparatively calm, mainly because there was no large influx of migrants traveling through that region that would have created friction and thus caused conflict to emerge. As a young officer and brevet lieutenant, Hancock set about performing the duties of his rank, getting to know the ins and outs of army life. One of the main duties was being in charge of recruitment. His excellent ability at recruiting caused him some problems when the Mexican-American War broke out in 1846. Although in September of that year he received his commission as a regular second lieutenant, he had become valuable to the War Department as a recruiter, so he was put in charge of a group of young recruits destined for Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis from Cincinnati, Ohio. Once he arrived in St. Louis, he was ordered to Fort Scott, Missouri to the unhappiness of his superior in Cincinnati who saw him as an invaluable recruiter. He was sent back to the Newport Barracks on the Kentucky side of the Ohio River across from Cincinnati. Wanting to be involved in the war, he set about trying to find a way to be transferred to the front lines. He wrote to his brother Hillary on May 5, 1847, stating, The only thing that grieves me is that I cannot get to Mexico. I made an application today to join the army going to the front, but he thought it was doubtful. He had a lot of responsibilities in Newport Barracks, as the superintendent of recruiting services for the Western Division and as assistant inspector general, but he longed to be where the action was. He wrote to the colonel of the barracks and to the adjutant general to be sent to Mexico. Finally, on May 31, 1847, Hancock was ordered to conduct a body of recruits to Mexico and rejoin the 6th Infantry. It took nearly a month before he set out for his journey down the Ohio River, down the Mississippi, and to New Orleans. There he boarded a ship destined for Veracruz, the amphibious landing location for General Scott's army. By the time Hancock made it to Veracruz, Scott's army had pushed a couple hundred miles inland all the way to Puebla, Mexico, the nation's second city with around 80,000 people. Scott waited there for reinforcements. Hancock left the port city the day after arriving with a contingent of 2,500 men under General Franklin Pierce. Hancock, along with the reinforcements, traveled the hundreds of miles toward Puebla, being fired upon by guerrillas along the way. It was a brutal march, but the contingent arrived in Puebla on August 6th, bringing Scott's army to a little more than 10,000 men. The very next day, Scott moved out his army toward the capital city. Hancock and the 6th Infantry Regiment were in Brigadier General William J. Worth's division, and they moved out two days later, giving many of the men who had traveled hundreds of miles a rest before proceeding inland. General Scott attacked Mexico City from the south in an unexpected movement, and it was the 6th Infantry in Colonel Newman S. Clark's brigade that moved through the lava fields and pushed the enemy to the fortified convent at Cherubusco. They made several charges against the position before carrying it. Hancock sustained a minor wound that he didn't even notice in the thick of the fight. The baptism by fire experienced by Hancock was a pleasant experience for the young man. He thoroughly enjoyed combat. He would receive a brevet promotion to first lieutenant for gallant and meritorious conduct at Cherubusco. After a short armistice, Scott resumed his assault against Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana's army. Worth's men fought around two hours involving fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The brigade lost half of its officers and one-third of its men, which placed Hancock in command of his company. The final push against Chapultepec was made on September 13th, but Hancock was lying in his tent, sick with chills and a fever. However, once he heard the sound of battle, he emerged from his tent. Wrapping my blanket around me, he wrote, I crept to the top of the roof of the nearest house and watched the fight, and had strength enough to cheer with the boys when the castle fell. By the time Scott's army marched into Mexico City, Hancock was back in the ranks. With the capital captured, the army stayed in the city for nine more months as negotiations transpired. While the army settled into their new location, friendships emerged as each man 
had more time on their hands. He quickly made friends with the new commander of his company, First Lieutenant Lewis Armistead, and the other officers of his regiment, including Lieutenant Edward Johnson and Simon Bolivar Buckner. A new second lieutenant joined the regiment, a Virginian named Henry Heath. Armistead, Hancock, and Heath were messmates, and as Heath stated, never was a mess happier than ours. Heath and Hancock became close friends, especially when Heath found out that the ladies of Mexico were infatuated with Hancock. Heath, to gain attention from the ladies, stuck close to the side of his messmate. Heath stated, Hancock was then a magnificent specimen of youthful beauty, as he afterwards was of manly looks. He was tall, graceful, a blonde with light hair, the style of all others that at once captivated the Mexican girls. Heath admitted, I owed my invitations to Hancock with whom these senoritas were in love. After a few months of being in the capital, Clark and his men were ordered to the south to help collect taxes. There, at a large plantation, Hancock, Clark, Heath, and the regimental adjutant were invited to eat dinner. Heath and Hancock spied the beautiful daughter of the plantation owner, and during a walk through the garden, spied her again. Now is your chance, old fellow, Heath said. Pluck a rose and go for her. I will remain here, gather flowers, and watch. If her duenna comes, I will be seized with a coughing spell. You must do a heap of lovemaking in a short time, for you may never have such a chance again. Hancock then set off with the flower in hand. When I took her hand, Hancock explained, I squeezed it just a little and she returned it. Then he found out that she was going to be traveling to England to finish her schooling and attempted to convince her to come to the United States to finish her schooling and they would be married. When Heath's back was turned, he kissed her and told her he had never loved before. Hancock came back to Heath. He relayed the story to the Virginian and Heath replied, how could you have told such a story? I know you have said the same thing to half a dozen girls in the city of Mexico and God knows how many in the States. Hancock replied, We are at war with Mexico. Peace has not yet been made. And you know, all is fair in love and war. When the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed, the U.S. Army moved to the coast to board transports, and it is there that Hancock got into trouble. He was now the official regimental quartermaster for his regiment, and the 6th Infantry was ordered to move toward the port to start embarking. But the 2nd Dragoons had mixed up multiple buckets of juleps for the 6th Infantry to drink as they passed by. Some soldiers imbibed more than others, and Hancock's quartermaster wagons were snarled in a traffic jam. The new lieutenant colonel of the regiment, Gustavus Loomis, exclaimed where everyone could hear, This is all Hancock's fault. If he had attended to his duty, this blockage would not have occurred. He has shamefully neglected his duty. A drunk Hancock confronted Loomis in the commander's tent where he was reading his Bible. Winfield sweared at Loomis, taking issue with Loomis's claims that he had neglected his duty. The lieutenant colonel ordered him back to his own tent and under arrest. Heath escorted Hancock back to his tent and put him to bed. The young Pennsylvanian awoke and was told of what he had done, which mortified him so much that he apologized for his actions and words. Hancock's courageous service was not dampened by the incident and he went along with his regiment to New Orleans. The 6th Infantry made it safely to New Orleans, then steamed up the Mississippi River to Jefferson Barracks, where it was joined by the 7th and 8th Infantry Regiments. All of the men and officers knew that their unified commands would soon disperse. As Hancock's biographer stated, everyone knew that in a very short time the regiments would be split up and scattered over the western frontier, their brief existence as actual units ended except on paper in the War Department. A company here, a company there, and the thrill of fighting a real war would fade, leaving only memories of the battles with Santa Ana's force. In the meantime, however, each of the regiments gave a ball for its officers and the ladies of St. Louis. A final fling before the deadening routine of the peacetime army fastened its grip again. As the regimental quartermaster, Hancock was responsible for getting all the supplies ready to throw the party, so he and Henry Heath would make several trips into St. Louis to gather all the necessary equipment. Heath, however, found a St. Louis beauty on one of his trips, and had to find ways to see her without Hancock because, as Heath said, I knew if Hancock accompanied me, my cake would be all dough. She would never look at me. After the festivities, Heath convinced the commander of the barracks to let the band and officers parade around the city of St. Louis and serenade the young ladies. They spent the better part of an evening doing this, 
and as they were about to head back to Jefferson Barracks, a local who had been walking with the group exclaimed that the most beautiful girl in the West had just returned from her trip in the East and that she needed to be serenaded. The group then headed to the young lady's home where they played some tunes for her. Her window shutter opened slightly and something white was thrown out. It was a white glove. It was given to Hancock. Her name was Almira Russell. There was no time for romance in Hancock's life at this point. The 6th Infantry was split up and Hancock's group went to Fort Crawford in Wisconsin while Heath's group went to Fort Atkinson in Iowa. The two friends were only separated for a short while until Heath came down with a serious case of dysentery, which he had contracted in Mexico. The Virginian was sent to Fort Crawford where the medical facilities were better equipped to take care of him, but the doctors soon pronounced the young man's life nearly at an end and they sent him to Richmond to die. Since he was too weak to travel by himself, Hancock volunteered to accompany him home. As they traveled by steamer down the Mississippi River, then up the Ohio, by the time they reached Cincinnati, Heath's condition had improved greatly. They stopped over in that city where Hancock took care of some business. A young lady had expected marriage, and Hancock had to straighten out the situation. They came to an agreement that they would be lifelong friends, but nothing more. Hancock and Heath went to Cleveland then, where Heath had another setback. Hancock nursed his friend back to traveling ability, and the two set off for New York City. On May 10th, 1849, they went to the Astor Opera House. A riot erupted outside the theater where 22 people were killed. However, the two young soldiers were unharmed. After the harrowing escape, they decided to pay General Scott a visit. The two officers were invited to dinner with the general, where they had shad and potatoes. Scott bragged about the taters that he got from a friend who grew them in New Jersey. When the plates were set down in front of Hancock and Heath, Winfield took his fork and began mashing his taters. Scott was aghast. He exclaimed, My God, my young friend, do you mash your potatoes? You can't tell the taste of potato when it's mashed. Hancock replied, I like my potatoes mashed. The witty Heath watched how Scott ate his potatoes and imitated the old general, then said, Yes, general, I can't tell the taste of potato when it's mashed. Hancock glared at the Virginian. When the two left the general's quarters, Hancock berated his friend, and Heath laughed until he nearly cried. For the rest of his life, Heath never failed to tell the potato story on Hancock. The two messmates then traveled to Philadelphia, then to Washington, D.C., where the two split up. Heath going on to Richmond, feeling much better, and Hancock heading back to Fort Crawford. By the end of the year, regimental headquarters was placed back at St. Louis, so Hancock was able to visit the young lady who had thrown her glove from the window. It was Major General Don Carlos Buell who introduced the two. Almira was the blonde-haired daughter of Samuel Russell, a prominent merchant in St. Louis. Winfield wasted no time in wooing Almira. By January 1850, the two were married, with Buell, Orlando Wilcox, and Anderson D. Nelson being the groomsmen for Hancock. A St. Louis resident described Almira as such, a woman of fine physique and striking comeliness of face, an accomplished musician, sparkling conversation, read the gems of repartee, and bounteously endowed with a kind and generous nature. She was universally admired and beloved. By October 1850, the two saw the birth of their first child, a boy named Russell. The couple and their child moved to Jefferson Barracks, but found their quarters dilapidated, with no hinges or keys for the doors. Hancock reached out to the post commander, Braxton Bragg, to help with the situation, but Bragg informed Winfield that a major had occupied the residence previous to him, and if it was good enough for a major, it was good enough for a lieutenant. The two began a heated exchange of letters until General Clark stepped in and had the place fixed for the couple. As regimental quartermaster, Hancock languished as a stagnant lieutenant. He was excellent at his job. He was a master over army protocol and was very generous and kind to those who he worked with. On November 5, 1855, he was finally appointed to captain in the quartermaster's department. He accepted it because it was a promotion but he wanted to perform military duties outside of being a quartermaster. In February 1856, the Hancocks were ordered to Florida at Fort Myers. He and his family traveled there not knowing that hostilities were about to begin with the Seminoles. This would be the third attempt to subdue and remove the Seminoles from their homes in Florida. Previous to this, Hancock was a quartermaster for a garrison in an easily accessible landscape. However, now he had to supply the army within a swampy and inaccessible area but the captain performed his duties superbly, with his superiors giving him great compliments for his work. Because of the hostilities, the family was unable to venture out of the garrison. 
Hancock attempted to get a milk cow to his quarters by ship from Tampa four times before the cow survived the journey. Almira and Russell did get to travel upriver on a boat, but had to lie in the bottom of the boat with a heavy rubber blanket covering them every time an Indian was spotted on shore. The situation was especially hard on Almira. She was the only woman at Fort Myers, but she made the best of the situation. Orlando Wilcox commented on Hancock's home by saying it was a perfect oasis in the desert to the rest of us, and the liberal hospitality and genial cordiality of Captain and Miss Hancock shed a glow of sunshine over our precious visits. On February 24, 1857, the Hancock's second child was born, a girl named Ada. She was the first white child known to be born in Fort Myers. After a little over a year in Florida, Hancock was sent to Fort Leavenworth to oversee quartermaster duties related to the situation known as Bleeding Kansas. By mid-May 1858, he was responsible for outfitting an expedition destined for Utah, led by Albert Sidney Johnston to subdue the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who were refusing to recognize the governor sent by President James Buchanan. He assembled a train of 128 wagons, five ambulances, and a thousand mules for the expedition and accompanied it. However, by the time Hancock and the rest of the troops made it to Salt Lake City on June 26, 1858, a peaceful settlement had already been reached. Hancock was then ordered to Fort Bridger in the southwest corner of what is now Wyoming. When he arrived, he found the 6th Regiment unified and ordered to California. Hancock worked diligently to assemble all the necessary supplies for the expedition to California. They began their journey on August 21st and arrived at a town a little northeast of San Francisco on November 15th, having traveled 1,119 miles. Hancock soon took a leave of absence to escort his family to California, but Almira was hesitant. It was Colonel Robert E. Lee who took her aside and explained that it could be fatal to a young couple's happiness to live apart. She took his advice and agreed to make the trip. They first visited Washington, D.C. and intermingled with the town socialites. The Democratic Party being in power, Hancock was right at home politically, as he mingled with Senator Jefferson Davis and Colonel Joseph E. Johnston. On April 4, 1859, the Hancocks left for their trip to California. The trip was a nightmare. They were packed on an overcrowded steamer and went to the Isthmus of Panama, where they disembarked and waited in 100 degree heat for 14 hours without water, hearing rumors that marauders had massacred the last steamer that had traveled through the Isthmus. Once on the Pacific side, they sailed on the ship, the Golden Gate, also overcrowded. A group of men began harassing young Russell, resulting in Winfield getting into a fist fight and whipping them with his bare hands and threatening to kill anyone who came close to his family. The rest of the trip was comparatively calm. They arrived in San Francisco on May 23rd, then orders reached him that he was to go to Los Angeles. They boarded a steamer that afternoon. He was now chief quartermaster of the Southern District of California, headquartered at Los Angeles. Thank you all so much for watching. Please stay tuned for part four coming up next week, and I'll see you next time. Los Angeles didn't offer much to the army inhabitants, except for the beauty of fertile fields and snow-capped mountains in the distance. The town consisted of around 4,000 people, the great majority Spanish-speaking. The only attractions were gambling halls and saloons, but Almira and a lady friend would organize a trip to the coast every so often. But after performing that trip with the coachman carrying a shotgun to scare off coyotes multiple times, the trip got duller and duller. The Catholic majority disapproved of a Protestant church being built so a Philadelphia preacher held service in his home for the tiny congregation. Almira played the pop organ during the service. This was one of the first times in a long time that Winfield lived in a civilian setting where he could make friends outside of army officers. One of these men he became good friends with was Joseph Lancaster Brent, a lawyer from Louisiana. He had come to California to practice law and had developed close ties with the citizenry of Los Angeles. And what made him become good friends with Hancock was that he was a Democrat. Just a short time in the future, when the Civil War would break out, Brent would offer his services to the Confederacy and attain the rank of general. Phineas Banning, a native of Delaware who had traveled to California for the opportunities available there, became a close friend of Hancock as well. Banning created a port for Los Angeles on the San Pedro Bay and organized stage and rail lines to transport people and goods from town to port. Winfield and Phineas became such good friends that Banning named one of his sons, Hancock, in honor of his friend. He would also be an influential promoter of Hancock in his later years as Winfield ran for political office. 
It was in California that Hancock waited for news of the 1860 presidential election. Always a good Democrat, Hancock grew concerned over two things, the rise of the sectional party known as the Republican Party and the splitting of his own Democratic Party, Northern Democrats for Stephen Douglas and Southern Democrats for John C. Breckinridge. Believing that the government had no right to interfere in a domestic institution like slavery, he cast his ballot for John C. Breckinridge. The Deep South began seceding from the Union with the election of Abraham Lincoln, and tensions grew in California. General Edwin Sumner traveled to the state to offer command of all forces there to Albert Sidney Johnston, but Johnston had sent his resignation and cast his lot with Texas, his adopted state. Pro-secessionists in the southern portion of California were rumored to be planning some kind of insurrection and to take over federal supplies in Los Angeles. It was nearly single-handedly that Hancock organized the defense of federal property in his district. However, Winfield knew that the fighting would not be in California if a war was to be had, so he began writing letters to General Scott, Postmaster General Montgomery Blair, and the Governor of Pennsylvania to get transferred east. He decided to stay loyal to the United States. Hancock's biographer explained, Hancock was by heredity and conviction a staunch believer in the integrity of the Union. He had been educated and trained as a soldier by the federal government. The time had come for him to offer his sword, and if necessary, his life in defense of that Union. It was as simple as that, and his political disagreements with the administration's policies were of no consequence at all. Hancock reportedly explained his stance as such, My politics are of a practical kind. The integrity of my country the supremacy of the federal government, and an honorable peace, or none at all. Hancock was surrounded by Southern men who were about to dedicate their lives to the Confederacy. They held a party before they all departed for the East to join different sides. Among those at the party were George Pickett, Richard Garnett, Louis Armistead, and Albert Sidney Johnston. Mrs. Johnston sung some heartfelt songs and became emotional at the thought of these Army friends going in different directions to fight against one another. One of the most distraught at the thought of abandoning such a good friend was Louis Armistead. He took Hancock by the shoulder and said, Hancock, goodbye. You can never know what this has cost me. I hope God will strike me dead if I am ever induced to leave my native soul, should worse come to worst. He then gave Hancock a brand new major's uniform that he would have no longer use for. Armistead then gave Almira his prayer book inscribed Louis A. Armistead, Trust in God, and fear nothing. Then the party ended, and the separation began.